Let's pray. Amen. So in our last presentation, we were looking how the Bible can be condensed into two stories. The cap Babylonian captivity and the pagan Roman captivity. And we saw that in the Babylonian captivity, it began with Babylon and then it also goes through Medo-Persia and then pagan Rome. And that's where the Bible stops historically in AD 100. We then saw that from 4 BC, the birth of Christ, the baptism of Christ, the death of Christ, the stoning of Stephen, up to 100 AD, all of this is basically the New Testament story. And this is historically the history of the pagan Roman persecution. But pagan Rome carries on persecuting God's people all the way to 538. But this is prophetically shown in the Bible, it's not historically shown in the Bible. And then the persecution by the papal church is also prophetically shown in the Bible, but it's not historically there. What's historically shown in the Bible is the persecution from Babylon all the way to 100 AD, which is pagan Rome. This history here. Now, when you introduce the prophetic narrative, it takes you from this point all the way to 1798. Now, we know that 1798, going the way back to 538, is three and a half times. And we learn from Leviticus 26 that the punishment, this perfect punishment, this promise, is seven times. So if this is three and a half times, then we know from this point, 538, all the way back down here to the captivity here in Babylon is also a three and a half times. So you have three and a half times and three and a half times. So we constructed this line. Um, I can give you the date for this one. This is 723 BC, where this punishment by Babylon begins. So that's what this, oh, that's what this schematic is showing. It says Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Pagan, Rome is three and a half times, or 1260, then papal persecution is also 1260. We've identified this date as 1798, 538, and this would be 723 BC minus. Now we're looking at more detail here. And for us to look at this detail, then we need to understand a little bit about the churches. We've seen, we know that there are seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. So we saw that Ephesus is the New Testament church. It begins here in the New Testament. Then we saw that there was a 10-year persecution in Smyrna. And we saw that that was from 303 to 313, thereabouts, depending on some people have different numbers, but that's a good, reasonable date to work with. This is Smyrna. And then you have Pergamos. And then after Pergamos, you have Thyatira. So I just want to give a brief overview of the relationship between these four churches. So if I did it here, one, two, three, four. These are the four churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. Now, if you were to look at the story of this church, we'd go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. I'm not going to read the verses, but you could go there. You'll see that this church is described as being white, which is a pure church, and it conquers. It's this glorious church that conquers and is pure. So, Ephesus is a faithful church. And then we saw Smyrna, number two, remember, 
it's going to receive persecution by the pagan Roman government. So this faithful church is going to be persecuted. It gets persecuted because it's faithful. The Bible teaches what? Those who are godly shall be what? Shall suffer persecution. So there's faithfulness and there's persecution. After the persecution, the church begins to compromise. It begins to have this relationship with Constantine, who's a pagan emperor, that converts to Christianity nominally, doesn't really become a Christian, and he relaxes all the rules, all the punishment that the Christians are getting, and they begin to lower their standards, and they want to essentially integrate into society. So Pergamos is a church of compromise. And once the church compromises, now you're back into this story, remember, which is essentially rebellion. What happens if a church, church of God compromises? What will God do? Sorry? Punish them. So when they're faithful, Satan will bring persecution upon them the people, when you compromise or you rebel or you don't obey God, then God will punish. So you can see, if you're faithful, you're going to receive punishment or persecution. If you're unfaithful, you're going to receive punishment or persecution. So whatever happens, God's church are always going to get persecuted. But this persecution was persecution because you're godly and this persecution is because you're unfaithful. This was primarily brought about by Christ. God is punishing his people here in the dark ages and this one is Satan persecuting his, God's people because they're faithful. But we can see a cause and effect and a cause and effect. So I want to show us that so, you can do this, cause and effect, cause and effect. Faithfulness, persecution. Unfaithfulness, persecution. So, that's a, that's a nice, simple way, I think, of understanding um, these four churches. So, coming back to 538 to 1798. This is the fourth church, and it's Thyatira. We know it's papal Rome. We, we understood that. It's the papacy. And the papacy's name is Jezebel. So we've got Jezebel, who is the papacy. Now, who does Jezebel marry? So you've got Jezebel, and you've got Ahab. So, Jezebel is marrying Ahab. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Ahab is a king, remember? Revelation 17. Pick up from verse 1. Oh, if we keep your, keep your hands in Revelation 17, I need to go to Revelation 12 first to put something in place. Keep your hands in Revelation 17, and we're going to go to Revelation 12. We need to go to Revelation 12 before we do 17. We're going to go to verse 14. Revelation 12, 14. Before we read 14, I'll give you a bit of background. Revelation 12 is, discusses two symbols. There's a woman and there's a red dragon. The woman is going to give birth to a child and the dragon is going to try and kill the child and this child escapes and when it escapes it gets taken up to heaven. So who is this child that the woman gives birth to? Do we know? 
This is Jesus. The birth, the child is Jesus, and the woman is who? Sorry? It must be the church. And what church gave birth to Jesus? It must be here, Ephesus, this first church. So Ephesus is the church that gives birth to Jesus. Then Satan wants to try and destroy Jesus, and he doesn't, he, he doesn't happen because Jesus escapes to heaven. And who is it that was trying to punish or hurt Jesus? Pagan Rome. So pagan Rome becomes the tool or the symbol that Satan is going to use. Remember we saw in Matthew 13 that the enemy was a symbol of Satan, the devil, and he's going to sow tears into the field, who are his agents. So Satan is going to use pagan Rome to try and destroy Jesus. You okay with that history? How would you explain it? Oh. We know what? Oh, okay. Um, could you hold on to that question? Yeah. Remind me if I don't address it. So I want to go back into this and deal with Ephesus in a bit more detail. So we're in Revelation 12, there's this woman. Uh, one thing I would say is the woman, which is in verse 12, what does she end up doing? In verse 14. And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. So this woman goes where? Can we see that it's talking about this three and a half times here? This woman flies into this place. It says times, times and half a time or dividing of time. Yeah? So this three and a half times here is where the woman goes into. Now this woman is the church, it's not Jezebel. This woman is Thyatira. The woman that's been spoken of in Revelation 12 is Thyatira, and Jezebel is going to try and seduce her. So, when it says for three and a half times, where is she in this three and a half time period? Can we see that? It says in verse 14. So, this period here is a period of the wilderness. Can we see that? This is the wilderness period. Revelation 12, 14. It's three and a half times, or 1260. Now let's go to Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So there's a whore, a prostitute, who sits on waters. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of a fornication. Verse 3. So this angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So, where's this woman being found in verse 3 that John is carried into? Where does it say? He carried me away in the spirit into the, into the wilderness and he sees this woman. So, John's in this place here. Can we see that? The, Re the wilderness of Revelation 12 is the same wilderness of Revelation 17. They're the same wilderness period. Same wilderness place. Uh, sorry, time period. Can we see the connection between Revelation 12? The wilderness is a time period, and he's taken into this time period to see this woman. Hopefully we can see that. 
So the woman that he's, he's watching is Jezebel. That's her name. What was Jezebel doing? In the original history, she's married Ahab. Is that a legitimate relationship? So it's a fornication. So let's go back into verse 2. It says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Can we see that? So Ahab committed fornication with Jezebel in the literal story. And now, in this wilderness time period, we see this symbology being reinforced that this woman is committing fornication with, it says here, the kings of the earth. Can we see that? So Ahab, who's the king, who's he a symbol of? It says the kings of the earth. Plural. So we've got kings. So Ahab is represented as the kings and Jezebel in this story is who? Verse 1. The judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters. Verse 3. So carry me away in the wilderness and saw a woman sit on a scarlet coloured beast. So it's this woman prostitute. Can we see that connection? We're in the history of Thyatira. We're in the history of the wilderness. And in the wilderness you have someone called Jezebel who has seduced God's people and taught them wrong. And she's married Ahab. And Ahab, we know he was a king. He's symbolised as the kings of the earth. And Jezebel is this woman who's a prostitute. So we've connected all of those pieces together. Where is this woman sitting? In verse 1. In verse 1. So the woman sits on waters and then verse 2, sorry, verse 3, where is she sitting? Okay, so we've got waters, so waters must equal what? It must be the beast. Can we see it's repeating in large? In verse 1 it says waters and in verse 3 it says beast. So she sits on the waters and she sits on the beast. You can see that? Let's go back to verse 2. Who else is she sitting on now? In verse 2. She's sitting on the kings. So I want us to see that the woman sitting on water sitting on the kings and sitting on the beast are just different symbols for the same thing. So, we, it tells you directly she sits on waters. It tells you directly she sits on beasts. And it says with the kings, what is she doing? Verse 2. She commits fornication with the kings. Let's go to verse 15 going to tell you what these waters symbolise. He said unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the woman, the whore, sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So, who would, how would we describe all of those? Peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. We could say nations. In the plural. And if we go back to verse 2, it says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So who are the inhabitants of the earth? They must be the waters, which are the peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. In verse? Mm-hmm. Amen? I agree with that. So, the nations in verse 15 
is describing what the waters are in verse 1. The waters are the nations. But in verse 2, the woman's committed fornication with the kings and with the people. So we know that the kings are ruling what? They're ruling the nations, the people. So you know that the kings are the beast of the waters. So all of these three symbols are synonymous terms. I want us to see that connection. And it's all predicated upon this story of Jezebel and Ahab. Now this is papal Rome. Now if we go to verse 5, we've identified what her name is. Her name is Jezebel. Now we're going to identify what her title is. And upon her forehead, she's wearing a crown or a tiara, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So what's her title? Her name is Jezebel and the title is? Babylon. So the papal church is now Babylon. We can see that? It says we've got her name, we've got her title, and now what do we know? It says she's also the mother of harlots. So this is her family, this is her family relationship. So she's Jezebel, she's Babylon, and now she has some familial relationship. What else? What is that? She's a mother. And who are her daughters? Because they're harlots, and a harlot is what? Harlot is a prostitute. In other words, for a female prostitute. So these daughters, that she, these children that she's got are daughters. Let me put it that way. And the daughter is a woman, and the woman is a church. Three? Okay, so if you go back into this history, a mother produces offspring. And this mother is the papal church. And what offspring did the papal church produce? You said it earlier. Three? So it produces all the Protestant churches. So the Protestant churches were the daughters of the mother and when they first were created they first came into existence were they harlots or not they were not harlots they were protesting they were protesting prostitution they were fighting and resisting prostitution but now in verse 5 you've got to a stage in this history that what have all these protestant churches become Copies of whom? Copies of their mother. They've all become prostitutes. So, from 538, it's around this time period that they're created and they're pure. So now we're dealing with a time period here at the back end of this period where all the churches have now become corrupted. So... When we put all of this together, we can see that from 538 to 1798, we're dealing with a history that's dealing with the papal church. The papal church's name is Jezebel. Her title is Babylon. And in her family, she's a mother of other prostitutes. So we've collected all of that information together. Now... Where is Rome ruling from? From the city of Rome, we know that. Yes? So, here he rules from the city of Rome. And what's the extent of the Roman Empire? The, Ro the Papal Roman Empire. How far does it extend? Does it, does it go to South Africa? In this history, it goes, to, it, it goes to South America, does it? Yeah. 
Does it go to Australia? China? You'll see in all of this history, it doesn't have that extension of power. Its authority, its, its, its mark and its stamp is centralised in the European nations. Now we know that they try to extend their power to different parts of the world, but the centralisation of their power is all in Europe. So let me ask the same question in a different way. So Ahab, it says it's the kings. Who are the kings that are supporting Papal Rome? Three? Okay, so you're saying it's here, the toes that are symbolised in this graphic, it's all of these powers are what nations? So the European nations. Now she might try to extend her reach across the world, but for her to extend her reach, who must she be using? Must be doing the European nations. So these kings, who are, rep who are represented by Ahab, are what kings? The kings of Europe. So, Yep. Sister Daisy? Some people say it like that, it's the then known world, but it's also connected to where God's people are. And if you go back to this history here, God's people are located in the Middle East, which is where all of this struggle is going on. Babylon, Medea, Persia, Greece, it's all in the Middle East. No, he doesn't conquer the whole world in, in, by any measure. It's, it's, you know, he reaches up to India, and it's the Middle East, and a limited part of Europe, and some of North Africa, but he doesn't conquer the whole world. So is it a case, from, is it a case where, like, from the perspective of people, they rule everything? Is, is it like yes. That? It's for where God's people are centred. So in this history, it's the kings of Europe that are the power base of Rome, and then they try to conquer other parts of the world. That's, what, that's all I want us to see. So when it says that this woman's name is Babylon, and she's based in the continent of Europe, supported by the kings of Europe, her reign or her land must be called the land of Babylon symbolically and where is Babylon what part of the world is Babylon it has to be Europe so we've developed a model that has Jezebel Ahab Babylon, the 1260, and Europe. So when we put all of this together, what we're beginning to see is that the Bible is talking about a history where Babylon has now shifted from the literal Babylon, which is in Iraq, and has now moved to a mystical or a symbolic Babylon, which is now in Europe. And it's shifted from a literal king called Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the north, to a symbolic king of the north, who's now papal Rome. So this history here is the history of papacy as it begins to interact and deal and persecute God's people. And it's all predicated on this symbology 
that it's dealing with Babylon. And Babylon is Europe. Hopefully we can see that. When does the transition from Papal Rome to Modern Rome? So, in 1798, there's a deadly wound that's delivered to the papacy. And then after the deadly wound has been given, the deadly wound begins to heal. And as it begins to make inroads again, that's when we're going to begin to transition from Papal Rome to what we would call Modern Rome. Now, if you, take, if you go back here, and you go back to those around 200 years, approximately 200 years, In fact, you wouldn't actually go to 321, you'd actually go to 330 AD. So, you've got these 208 years. And w this is the transition when the papacy really begins to affect or impact the world till it finally rules. Can we see that connection, this approximately 200 year period? So if you bring that into our own history, seventeen ninety-eight is when Papal Rome comes off the scene. Three thirty AD is when Pagan Rome comes off the scene. It stops ruling supremely. And then there's this transition. As pagan Rome goes down, the papacy comes up. So, from 1798, you're going to have this same dynamic, and I'll do it this way. I'll put pagan goes down, and papal goes up. Can we see that history? Does that make sense? Pagan Rome has been ruling supremely. It's ruled the whole world. And then from 330, it takes 200 years for it to come to its demise. And at the same time, the papacy, around the same kind of time, from 321, begins to rise the ascendancy until it rules supremely in 538. So 1929 has an impact on history. We know it's not only uh, the Lateran Treaty, um, where the Papal States are reinstalled, but it's also the premier financial collapse, the 1929 financial collapse. There are a number of things that are happening in 1929. 1929 links the First World War to the Second World War, it's the rise of the Third Reich. There are a number of things that are happening in that history which are connected to the Lateran Treaty. So 1929 is a, is a prophetic waymark. So, from 1798, the papacy had gone down. Yes? It had been totally destroyed. So it's here at the bottom. And what's going to happen to the papacy? It's going to rise up. Would you agree with that? And for it to rise up, a nation needs to come down. So we're going to see who this nation is. So a nation's going to go down as this nation rises. So this is the papacy, which is modern, as Brother Rayon just asked. This is modern Rome as it comes to the ascendancy. But there's another nation that's going to come down. And we're going to discuss who that is. Once this has happened, we'll have reached this mark here. And now the papacy, modern Rome, has fully risen to this stage here. And depending on how you mark this, this is the Sunday law. And this would be Daniel 12.1. And it's going to take approximately about the same kind of time period. If you went 1798 and you went forward 200 years, where would it take you? Seventeen ninety-eight. 1898, 
Let's go 200 years into the future. Where would that take you? 19? Yeah? So it's around the 2000s, if you just took that history. And, it, and that's not a prophetic date or anything. All I'm saying is, once you rate around the 2000s... Oh, I've done that wrong, haven't I? Have I done that wrong? 1798, 200. All I just said, I went from 1798. I just said if you go back about 200 years into the future, yeah? It's not a prophetic date. I'm just saying if you go to around 200 years, you get to the time period of the 2000s. That's, all I'm, that's the only point I'm making. So there's going to have a period where a nation's going to fall and the papacy is going to rise. And this time, last time it took around 200 years, just over 200 years, it's going to take around the same kind of time. Because we're in this history now, aren't we? We're in the 2000s. And is there a Sunday law? Is there a Sunday law? There's no Sunday law. No, no, the Sunday law that's been predicted here is one that's been enacted, not blue laws that are on the books. Blue laws on the books have been around for a long, long time. I'm talking about the enactment of a national Sunday law in the United States. So that hasn't risen yet, and we're here. So we know, you look in the world, we know that's about to happen, don't we? There's so much evidence. But that was not a federal law. It was a state law in Alabama. I think that's what you just said. State laws, blue laws, have been on the books for a long time. There's been lots of persecution about Sunday. But there weren't federal laws. And this, this law here that we talk about is a federal law that's going to be enacted by the United States. And it's not just going to be issue about Sunday. Because even in the 70s, when they did that persecution about Sunday, they didn't touch the issue of the Sabbath and force people who were Adventists not to worship on Saturday. There wasn't that dual issue. It was only focusing on the Sunday. So we know we're in this history, so you know it's going to re be around that kind of time in the 2000s. We're already at 2017, past time. So what I want us to see, does that address your question? So you know the deadly wound will have been healed by here. And there's all this history that's going to take you to that. Coming back to this point, I want us to see that <coughs> Europe is being symbolised by Babylon. Hopefully we can agree with that. Now, we're not going to prove this, but I think most people are aware that 1798... is a fulfilment of Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40 says, At the time of the end, the king of the north shall come against him, so the king of the south shall come against him, the king of the north shall come against him with fury as a whirlwind. So all I want us to see in... 1798 is that it's identified as being the time of the end. So if we can set all of that up, that we've got Babylon, which is Europe, 1798 is the time of the end, and it's prophesied or fulfilled in Daniel 11, verse 40. Now, in this history here, there's this persecution that's going on. And we're in Revelation 17. Let's go back to Revelation 12. We read verse 14. We're going to read verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth, Revelation 12, 15, 
water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So there's a serpent that's going to pour something out of his mouth. And it says what he pours out of his mouth is water. And the water is like a flood. So it's a lot. Now, in the Bible, the mouth is a symbol of something. And in real life, what do we do with our mouth? We eat and we speak. So when we eat, it's things going in. That's eating. And when we speak, it's things coming out. We agree with that? So in Revelation 12, when it says something came out of his mouth, what came out of his mouth? He says waters as a flood, but what must, what must that be symbolising? Must be symbolising words. So there's these things that are going to come out of his mouth, and they do what? Verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth, waters as a flood after woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Carried away means destroyed. Hurt. Punished. So, this serpent is going to do what? He's going to speak words to try and destroy or hurt the woman. Can we see that? We read that in Daniel 7, verse 25. Daniel 7, verse 25. Sorry? It says, the same entity, this serpent, is identified as a little horn in Daniel 7, but it will speak great words against the Most High. And also it will tell you in Daniel 7 that it does what? It tramples upon the saints. The wording is that it wears out the saints of the Most High. So it's going to create laws that are going to punish or hurt God's people. We can see that? Verse 16, Revelation 12, verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. In verse 15, what comes out of whose mouth? Water comes out of whose mouth? The serpents. But in verse 16, it says it comes out of whose mouth? Uh uh-uh. uh. Comes out of the dragon's mouth. So you can see that the serpent and the dragon are connected. So, can you see you've got a connection here, Jezebel and Ahab? If we go to Testaments, Testaments and Ministers, 38, page 38, paragraph 1, TM 38.1, it says, Kings, rulers, and governors have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? Jezebel, the papacy, this prostitute. Kings, rulers and governors, kings, rulers and governors have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are identified as being the dragon that makes war with the remnant of the woman's seed. So, the dragon power is these kings of Europe in this history. And the dragon did what in verse 16? Cast out of his mouth. But it said the serpent did it. So if the dragon is the kings, who is the serpent? It's the papacy, it's Jezebel. So this is the serpent and this is the dragon. So you've got the dragon power and the serpent power. Both of them are pouring out floods of waters which are laws. So she's making religious laws and they're making secular laws. The religious laws 
are going to hurt God's people, hurt the religion, but a, sec- a religious law can't hurt us, can it? The Catholic Church said, all right, if our Adventist Church said, if you don't do this thing, we're going to disfellowship you. Would that change your life? It doesn't make any difference. It might hurt you, it might, you might feel sad, but it's not going to affect you materially. But if the government made some law, and they said, you're not allowed to speed, and if you sped, that would hurt you, because it would cost you something. So we know that both of them are going to be making laws. But who helps them? In verse 16, it says, the earth helps them. How does the earth help? It opens its mouth, and it swallows the flood. Yeah? It says, verse 16, the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the flood. So, if there's a law that's being enacted to persecute God's people, how does the earth swallow that law? It makes another law. So, the earth is making a law that's going to counteract this law. So, it says the earth. If we went to Revelation 13, the next chapter, there's a beast with lamb-like horns that's going to rise up out of the earth. And Ellen White says that that is a symbol of the United States. So the United States is going to do what? It's going to help the woman when it's being persecuted. And it's going to help the woman by creating another law to counteract or buffer these laws. And what law is that? The Constitution. But the Constitution is effective in what country? Only in America. It doesn't affect you in Europe. So there's no point having a law in America when you live in Europe. Is there? So what do you have to do if you want that law to protect you? You have to move to America. And if you move from one country to another, you're called a pilgrim. And, as my sister said, we call these the pilgrim fathers who went from Europe to which country? The United States. For what purpose? Religious freedom. Because who was offering them religious freedom? The United States. So you're going to go from Europe to where? To the USA. So here you go from Europe to the United States. We can see that connection. So God's people are going to be persecuted by the serpent and the dragon. And they're going to go from Europe and they go to the United States. But what country is Europe? Prophetically, symbolically. Sorry? Babylon here. So this is Babylon. They're going to leave Babylon and they're going to go to the United States. So tomorrow we're going to carry on this study and we're going to see the implications of what that means to those people and what it means to us at the end of the world. So let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to give you praise and thanks for your goodness and mercy. Please help us to honour you, to glorify your name. May we understand Bible prophecies. May we understand symbology so that we might be able to divide your word correctly. As we understand the work of the papacy in the history of Thyatira, We want to ask and pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding to make a correct application of what these truths mean to us at the end of the world. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.